I forgot to get David to do that. So uh, <laughs> Luke chapter 22, and uh, we're going to be looking at, as we mentioned last week, uh, the trials of Jesus. But before we do that, I do want to take a few moments to look at the betrayal of Jesus by Judas. And so in Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse, verse number 47, by the way, all four of the writers of the gospel all bring out this betrayal by Judas. But it says in Luke chapter 22, verse number 47, while he yet spake, you remember that Jesus had been in the garden of Gethsemane. He had been praying, the Bible tells us, with great drops of blood falling down to the ground from his sweat. And uh, he says to his disciples in verse 46 that it's time to get up and pray. And so verse 47, while he yet spake, behold a multitude, and he uh, that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? You know, often uh, Peter gets a bad rap because he's the one that drew the sword and cut off Malchus's ear. Uh, but all of the apostles were ready to fight. Is that what that verse says? Notice, said, notice that it says that uh, when they saw what was about to happen, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? Uh, they were ready to go to battle. And of course, they did not realize that Jesus' uh, kingdom was not of this world. And so they, they don't fully understand the kingdom and being of that Jewish background and expecting the Messiah to be a great warrior king, they thought it was time to go to battle. And uh, so uh, they're ready to fight for Jesus Christ. It says in verse 50, and one of them, of course we know that's Peter, smote the servant of the high priest. And of course we know from other accounts that's Malchus. And so he smote him, the Bible says, and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. Uh, allow this to happen. And uh, he touched his ear and healed him. You know, isn't it amazing that uh, here's a man that's an enemy of Christ. Peter draws his sword, cuts off his right ear, and Jesus heals him. It's, it's, uh, it's a wonder, at least in my mind, that at this point, Malchus doesn't say, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah. This is not right. But we don't see anything from Malchus to try to stop what is about to happen. And so... Uh, Why didn't Peter cut off Judas's ear? Well, I think he was aiming for Malchus's head and he just clipped his ear. Uh, that's what I think. I think he took a swipe and uh, I don't know how you exactly cut somebody's ear off in that uh, fashion. Because uh, if it's a downstroke, you think he's going to go past the ear and into his shoulder. So I don't know how he did it. Maybe may have been an upstroke. I don't know. Uh, but uh, yeah, Judas was the one that was behind it. So yeah, I don't know why they didn't attack Judas except that he was one of them. Maybe they didn't realize all that was going on. They see Judas coming with this crowd. I don't know that they realized that Judas was going to betray him at this point. But of course, Jesus knew that and Jesus had told them that one of them would betray him. And so somebody else got in that hand. Well, I, I, I think God was involved in it. There's no doubt about that. So verse 52, Then said Jesus unto the chief priests and the captains of the temple and the elders which were come to Him. Now notice that. Who is there? The whole bunch of council. Yeah, the whole, the whole group. They've got the chief priests. They've got the captains, the guards of the temple. And they got the elders, and he said, Be ye come out as against the thief with swords and staves. So what did they have? Weapons. They had weapons too. Mm -hmm. 
And so uh, it would be very natural for Peter and the apostles to say, if you want to scrap, let's go. And Jesus puts an end to that thought. My kingdom's not of this world, we will hear him say when we get into the, deeper into the text. So uh, they came with swords and staves. Uh, what is a stave? Some kind of club. It's a club, yeah. uh, like a walking stick, maybe a big walking stick. So they've got clubs, they've got swords, and uh, it, it's, it looks like, well, it's time to go to fisticuffs. And Jesus said, no, no, that's not right. Verse 53, he asked them, when I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me. What does that mean? I mean, they didn't try to seize him, so to speak. <laughs> So, so the Jewish customs and law were that if somebody speaks, speaks blasphemous words, and that's going to be the charge that's going to be laid against Jesus. When did you, when did you do that? They were to be stoned, right? Mm -hmm. When, when uh, were they to do that? Were they wait a week or two? It was immediate. It was immediate punishment. And so Jesus said, I was in the temple every day and you didn't try to take me. You didn't try to lay hands on me. And he says, but this is your hour and notice this, and the power of darkness. Power. The power of darkness. If we don't understand that Satan and his minions have power, then we're 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 fooling ourselves, and it's and it's uh, devastating for the Lord's church. If we if we just act like everybody's fine, even though they're teaching a false doctrine, that's okay because they love Jesus and they love God, and they're not really trying to do anything. Uh, when we do that, if we underestimate. The power of darkness, the power of Satan. Brethren, then it's just like in a nation when we underestimate the enemy that we're fighting, then we're doomed for a weapon. And so as God's people, we need to understand the spiritual battle that we are waging right now. And uh, you know that in Ephesians chapter 6 that we're begin in verse 10, put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles, the trickery of the devil. But he tells us in verse 12, now we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the darkness of this world. And brethren, we are in a spiritual battle. And if we set back and act like we're not, then we're destined to fail, brethren. Yes, sir. And Satan has used from the beginning of humanity the same weapons. Yep. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. That's exactly it's right. Every time. That's exactly right. And don't be blindfolded. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. We need to take off our blindfold. So let's turn now to Matthew's account of this. In Matthew chapter 26. And again, we're doing this as we've talked about in the past to uh, get a full picture of what's going on. And so we take each one of the accounts, we, we mesh them together, and then we get the totality of what all has taken place. Now remember a moment ago, we read that one of them, Peter cut off his ear, or, or it says somebody didn't name Peter, but it just cut off one of the chief priests his servant or his captain's ear. That's all it says in Luke's account. But when we turn to Matthew chapter 26, we see, and while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came. We're in verse 47. Luke, uh, or excuse me, Matthew 26, verse 47. One of the twelve came with a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. So what do we see that Matthew adds in this account? Numbers. Numbers. It's a big multitude. It's a, it's a huge crowd that they've stirred up to come to get Jesus. 
Verse 48, Now he that betrayeth them gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he, hold him fast. So what, is, what do we find in that verse that we didn't see in Luke's account? Judas tells them how he's going to betray him. This is the one. He tells them how he's going to do it, and he says, when I kiss him, y'all grab him, right? Y'all hold on to him. Well, it sounds like that Jesus is going to uh, defend himself or wrestle himself away. Okay. That's not the way it happens. Exactly. So verse 49, and forthwith he came to Jesus and stood and said, Hail, Master. The word master there is rabbi. So he's greeting him as a rabbi. That was a part of the plan. And he kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? What did he call him? Friend. Friend. Why are you here? There's nothing deeper than the betrayal of a friend. And that's what we see. Friend, what are you doing? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into its place. For all that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? How much is a legion? Hundred. About six thousand, if my my uh, my uh, uh, re research is correct. About six thousand. Oh, I was thinking of a centurion. Yeah. Yeah. So back up there where it says it's going to perish by the sword. So, you know, if you want to stay and fight, this world is not Jesus' home. So is it your home or my home? If we stay and fight, yeah. we're declaring this is our world. Well, and, I, and in this instance, it would have been wrong to fight. I don't know that it's wrong to fight in every instance, but in this instance, Jesus is telling them, this is their hour. How can you get that? That it's right to fight. Okay. Well, we've talked about self-defense before. Well, if you'd listened to some of your sermons, you wouldn't go on that like that. <laughs> I think I not only listened to it, I preached it. I, I understand that there is a time when we submit to evil. I've, uh, we've already talked about this numerous times. There is a time we submit to evil. But Jesus said a strong man in his house armed is not going to let somebody break in and take those things that belong to him. So how do we harmonize that? We Either we say Jesus contradicted himself or we understand that there are appropriate times that certain things can be done. It's not appropriate for us to serve Coke and chicken fried steak on the Lord's Supper, but that doesn't mean I can't have it at my house. So that, that's, I, I'm seeing a distinction. Bob, did you have something? Yeah, you, like you said, you preached a sermon on uh, self-defense, which is, which is right. And this is an example of Jesus Christ. The way we fight the battle for Jesus Christ is not a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. Mm -hmm. so That's two, exactly right. Two different types of battle. There. I'm, I'm reminded of that uh, congregation. I can't remember where it was. And some evil person coming in there was going to kill a bunch of people. And one of the men that was back shot and killed him. Yeah, that was up in Dallas. Yeah. Uh, uh, Fort Worth, that, the DFW Metroplex. I can't remember what congregation it is off the top of my head. I can't it's even like see that. There's, yeah, right there's, right. there's your example. I mean, uh, I mean, what are you going to do? Somebody comes in, is going to kill a bunch of people, and say, "Well, I'm going to pray for you." Well, and, and like I say, so you know, you have to use a little sense. I mean, we, this we, guy's going to kill a bunch of people. 
We've already discussed all that. Mm -hmm. That he will punish. And if you don't understand that, you don't understand the Bible. There's nobody here, Cliff, that is saying that vengeance does not belong to God. I haven't heard anybody ever say that. Uh, vengeance belongs to God, but, well, we're not going to rehash that. We've already gone over it uh, many times. Let's get back to the text. What is a legion? 6, About 6,000. So uh, 6,000 times 12 is what? 72,000. We sing a song he could have called 10,000 angels. We're, we're drastically wrong in our numbers on that song. I understand the uh, essence of the song and if he could call 72,000 then we can say he'd call 10,000. But the text actually indicates that he had a great host at his disposal. And uh, so at that point it is not time for a battle. And he says, if it was, then I would uh, call to my father and he would send down these angels. But notice why. Why, and Cliff, this is something I think you have to take into consideration. But how then shall the Scripture be fulfilled that it must be? If they had a fought a battle and won then they would have thwarted the plan of God. The Scripture had to be fulfilled. Keep that in mind when you're looking at it. So then Jesus said in verse 55, in that same hour said Jesus to the multitude, are ye come out against the thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sit daily with you in the temple teaching and he laid no hand on me, but all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled, then all the disciples forsook him and fled. If, if they would have fought a battle at this point, Isaiah 53 would have meant nothing. Psalm chapter 22 would have meant nothing. Those scriptures of the prophets have to be fulfilled. And so he says, that uh, if you fight now, the Scripture will not be fulfilled. So let's turn to Mark chapter 14. You know, you stop and think about it. Well, Peter was pretty courageous with that many soldiers standing all around all over the place and then he whacks off that guy's ear. That took some, that took some gall, didn't it? Yeah. So uh, verse 43 of Mark chapter uh, 14 Mark 14, verse 43. And immediately while he yet spake, now notice they all bring to our attention that this is after the Garden of Gethsemane, after Jesus has prayed three times, Father, if there's any other way, then let this cup pass. And the answer that God gives them is, there is no other way. This is how it must be. And so in verse 42, he tells his disciples, Get up, rise up, let us go. For he that betrayeth me is at hand. So verse 43, Immediately after this, while he yet spake, come a Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Take him and lead him away. What's that say? Safely. 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 What, what, is, what is in the mind of Judas even at this point? He probably thinks Jesus is just going to be beaten. Either he thinks that they're going to rise up and fight and maybe overcome it, or they're going to take Jesus but he doesn't want harm to come to Jesus. Take him away safely. Get, get him to a safe place. I don't think that Judas realized the implications of his betrayal. He didn't think that through. He did not think it through, and that's the reason that he's going to, I believe, commit suicide after all this is over because he is completely devastated by the turn of events. Well, he... He indicated to them 
the man that I kiss is he, is he. Right. As if they didn't know. Yeah, and I, and I don't know, uh, you know, it's dark, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to betray this one. You'll wreck now when I kiss him. Uh, so I don't know all the, the surrounding whys of all of this. We do know that Satan had uh, been allowed, uh, 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 Judas had allowed Satan to enter in his heart to betray him. We've already talked about that. And so uh, at this point, I really don't believe that Judas thought that it was going to go the way that it did. But you know what? Anybody to, he didn't want to be part of it. Yeah. And to say, so somebody else could say, well, you were there. Well, I didn't mean none of that. Yeah. And, and I think... He didn't think all that. Like you said, he didn't yeah. make it food. Like Lewis said. And, and, I, and I think that this... You know, I'm reading it, trying to draw some conclusions that Judas thought maybe Jesus might be whipped. I don't know what all he thought was going to happen, but I don't think he thought it would go like it is going to go. So anyway. Easy money. Easy money. Mm -hmm. So as soon as he was come, verse 45, he goes straightway to him and said, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid hands on him and took him. And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote his servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And again, Jesus, we've already read these words, or you come out against the thief with swords and with staves to take me. I was daily in the, with you in the temple teaching, and you took me not, but the Scriptures must be fulfilled. Again, Jesus emphasizing this is what the Old Testament taught. The prophets had to be fulfilled. And so they all forsook him and fled. And then we have an interesting statement beginning in verse 51. There followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid hold on him and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Uh, I don't know what that's about. <laughs> Well, I, I think partly God has a sense of humor, but that's my, my take on it. That here's this young man that's following after Jesus, and uh, I don't know if he had been roused from his bed, but he apparently had on his sleeping clothes, and when they went to get Jesus, they grabbed him too, and boy, he bolts like a deer in the headlight and leaves his cloth behind, and he runs away, the Bible says, uh, naked. And so now, John's account. John chapter 18, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, He went forth with His disciples over the brook Kidron, a brook, I'm sorry, the brook Kidron, uh, where there was a garden into which He entered and His disciples, and Judas also which betrayed Him knew the place. So what are we seeing this a uh, little bit of different wording in John's account? He didn't say Gethsemane. He says that brook, okay. the bedroom, where there was a garden, which mm -hmm. was Gethsemane. the garden of Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. And they they leave apparently Jerusalem, cross over the little creek, the Kidron Creek, which is what forms the Kidron Valley, and then the Mount of Olives is where they're going. And there's a garden there called the Garden of Gethsemane. And so. Uh, into which he entered in his disciples. And Jesus, or excuse me, Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus all times resorted thither with his disciples. So what did John say there? That was kind of a common place for Jesus to meet. Him. They went there quite often. It was a common place for them to go. And so Judas, verse 3, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees come up thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Who's the leader of the pack? Judas. Judas. They, they turn all these men over to Judas and Judas leads the multitude against Jesus. And they come, as we said just a moment ago, with lanterns and torches and weapons. And I think that may be why Judas said, as we read a moment ago, take him safely. We don't want him to be harmed. 
He sees the multitude and how they are primed. And we've said it before, when a multitude gets roused up, you don't know what they're going to do. And so He says, Jesus therefore, verse 4, knowing all things that should come upon Him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? Now remember a moment ago in the other three accounts, He said, Rise up, the hour's come, let's go. Now what do we find here? A little more intimate conversation. Okay, so Jesus knew and He comes to meet them and says, who are you looking for? Mm -hmm. who, who is it that you're seeking at this point? So when we weave all this together, we find additional information, especially from John's account about some of the details that the other guys didn't talk about. And so they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus saith unto them, I am he and Judas also which betrayeth him, or betrayed him, stood with them, and as soon as he had said this, said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. What happened there? Pentecostal say they were slain in the spirit. <laughs> I think that's where they get that. I don't. God's power is what I mm -hmm. see. His power was so great. Miracles. Okay. Mm -hmm. We see the power of God. We see a miracle. And uh, now, maybe we can have a little bit more sympathy with Peter when he draws his sword and whacks that guy because God already knocked him down. <laughs> and so we understand maybe a little bit of why, why Peter might have thought, hey, it's time to go to fist cuffs. I'm going to get my sword. God's already knocked them down. They fall to the ground. And so uh, I can understand why Peter misunderstood. And by the way, as we read from Luke's account, all of them were ready to get to battle. And so he says that they all went backward and fell to the ground. So God knocks them down. It's a miracle. It's the power of God. And they ask them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am He. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. So what does He say? Let the apostles go. Let the apostles go. And uh, that the same might be fulfilled which He spake, of them which thou gavest me, I have lost none. What does verse 9 indicate? It was prophesied that the disciples would escape, so to speak. And, and none of them were going to die. Mm -hmm. Not going to lose any of these that you've given me. And so, they're not going to die in this practice, if you want to say that. God's knocked them down. And he says, let these guys go. And then, Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it. This is when we find out it's Simon. So, God has knocked them down. There's this discussion. I don't know all the events. Uh, if we were standing there with a drone and filming it, 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 it just seeing it with no sound, you see it, them knocked down. And uh, then they get up, and then Peter gets his sword and he smote, verse 10, the priest, the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And then said Jesus to Peter, Put thy sword into the sheep. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Hmm. So, to be, for the scriptures to be fulfilled, these events have to transpire, including the betrayal of Jesus by Judas. And uh, he had to be able to say, It is written. Okay. And that it has been fulfilled because the scriptures have to be fulfilled. And uh, you remember that Jesus was betrayed in the house of his friends. Look at Luke, uh, Luke, I'm sorry, Zechariah chapter 13. 
Zechariah chapter 13. Look at verse 6. Zechariah 13 and verse 6. And one shall say unto him, it's talking about Jesus, the prophet, the husbandman, the one that the fountain is open to the house of David. He says, and one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hand? Then shall he answer those which I have, or I was those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Hmm. Now I have read a lot of commentaries that say that's not a prophecy about Judas. And I am not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But I don't see how you can miss that. That is talking about the betrayal of Jesus. And if we don't understand it from that, look at verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts, smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. So very clearly, Zechariah is prophesying that Jesus is going to be betrayed by a friend and he's going to receive wounds in his hands. And at that point, the shepherd is going to be smitten. And I want you to notice the language of verse 7. Uh, I've talked about this a little bit and I don't know all the details, but I understand there are some uh, preachers now in the brotherhood or who are saying that Jesus is not Jehovah. And I don't know why. I don't know all the implications of why they're saying that. I'm just hearing rumors through the grapevine, so I don't know all the details. But I want you to notice the language of Zechariah 13 and verse 7. Against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. The word Lord, if you notice in the King James, every letter capitalized. Capital L, capital O, capital O, or R, capital D. That means it is Jehovah. Yahweh. But what did he say about the man? He is my what? Companion. Fellow. He's my companion. He is one of my same nature. If we talk about being a fellow human being, what we're saying is we all share the same characteristics of human beings. And we are fellow men. This man is a fellow with God. That's why I know that Jesus is also Jehovah. And I've talked about this. I don't know all the details, but it seems to me it's almost like that Yahweh, which means the eternal existing one. That that description applies to not only God the Father, but God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. They are all Jehovah. So I've said on a number of occasions, I almost look like that and look at that like a surname, a family name. This is Jehovah. This Godhead that we worship they're made up of three distinct personalities. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so he says, Jesus Christ, the man who is my fellow. And so that is an affirmation, not only of the deity of Christ, but the fellowhood that he has with the Lord Jehovah, the Lord of hosts. I think that's a pretty convincing argument, at least to me it is, mm -hmm. that uh, Jesus is Jehovah. And again, I, I haven't <coughs> determined why that would be a problem with some. And I want to find out more details. Why, why would that be a sticking point to me? Why would, that, why would that come up? By the way, I've talked about this before. Brother Johnny Ramsey debated a man named Marvin Hicks, Oneness United Pentecostal. They call themselves Oneness because they believe there's only one in the Godhead, 
And it is God, Jehovah, the Father, but He will sometimes manifest Himself differently as the Son, and then they won't even say as the Spirit because they believe the Spirit is more of an influence. It's a power that God uses. And uh, Brother Johnny Ramsey took Marvin Hicks to the proverbial woodshed in that debate, and uh, there, I've got a copy in my office. I've read it numerous times. But one of the verses that Brother Ramsey used is Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. Hmm. The man that is my fellow. So we're not talking about Jesus in eternity. We're talking about Jesus as He comes to this earth and takes on manhood becomes a human being, but He's still God's fellow. He's still God. That's why we talk about Jesus being 100% God and 100% man. And I believe, this is my belief, and I think it's uh, grounded in Scripture, that Jesus will always through eternity, have that manhood. And you look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 5, there's one mediator between man and God, or men and God, the man, Christ Jesus. Yep. So, He's already ascended. He's sitting at the right hand of God. And Paul still says He has His manhood, His humanhood, even at that point. So anyway, uh, to me that's interesting stuff. I hope it is to y'all. By the way, Zechariah 13, if you haven't read it recently, it's power. If you haven't read Zechariah recently, I think it was a couple of years ago I preached through the book of Zechariah uh, on Sunday nights, if I remember right. Maybe my mind's off, but I think I did. And uh, we talked about some of Zechariah is a powerful book. Powerful book. So any thoughts, questions, comments? I wanted to ask. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> These people, they did not know the Old Testament, did they? You're talking about the ones that came after Jesus? All of it, you know, well, actually the betrayal and all this. If they had known their fulfilling, fulfilling scriptures, and so they didn't know the, the Bible, did they? They did, and they didn't. That scares me, because what if we are that way? That's scary. It is absolutely frightening to me, and y'all know my background coming from a denomination. And I fought tooth and nail against the truth, and as I've said before, and uh, I don't know if you've heard me talk about this or not, Wilma, but when a denominational person reads the Bible, and I go to the old John Connolly song, Rose Colored Glasses. Yeah. When, you're, when, you, when you're wearing rose colored glasses, the world's <laughs> rosy. So they pick up their denominational glasses and they read, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. <clears throat> and they, in their mind, somehow say, Yeah, but it doesn't have anything to do with our salvation. And they go on. And they, they keep going. And you go to 1 Peter 3, verse 21, the light figure we're in due baptism, although doth, doth now save us. And they're like, well, yeah, that's right, but it's not essential. <laughs> so it is a very frightening thing. And I think Will has raised a great point. We need to be careful as the New Testament church that we are not, and, and I'm, I'm trying to say this in a way that uh, is least offensive, but I want to get the truth out there. If, 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 if we're just following something because Diane Woods or Johnny Ramsey or uh, Alan Hires or whoever you want to throw out there, uh, if we're just following what they taught without delving into the Scriptures and really studying for ourselves and walking away 
That's why Paul said, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Second uh, Corinthians 13 and verse 5. We must be students of the book. And we've got to we've got to put aside our traditions and we've got to go to the Bible and see what the Bible says. And I'll give you a for example. We talked about it last week. I believe that Jesus was crucified on Thursday. Y'all already know that. It's no, no, uh, uh, no big flash news flash. I studied with a man, and I'm going to tell you exactly what he said. And if, if it's not verbatim, it's, it's pretty close. He said, Carrie, you have presented that in a way that, that I've never seen it done. He said, you gave Scripture for everything that you believe." But he said, but if Diane Woods, who was such a, <clears throat> an intelligent man, Brother Woods had gone to law school, almost had a photographic memory, he said, if, uh, if Brother Diane Woods couldn't see that, then I, I can't see it either. And he walked away. Hmm. And I told him, I said, uh, Brother, you are a denominational man and you don't even know it. I didn't say it exactly like that, but I told him that's where denominationalism comes from. He's worshiping the man. He's following after a man. I have great respect for men like Guy in the Woods. I do. I read his stuff. He's got he did the Free to Hardeman University question and answer sessions for years in Tennessee. From memory. People would come to him and ask him a question and he would, it, it was like he was writing an article, a treatise and he would go and break it down and I stand in awe of a man that has that kind of ability. But he is just a man. And he can be wrong. Uh, Brother Robert Taylor Jr. whom I love very dearly passed away last year, I believe it was. A walking, talking Bible. But I don't agree with everything Brother Taylor said. And we've got to be students of the book ourselves, not what somebody else has said. It is frightening, and I agree. Anything else? Book, All right. chapter, book chapter, verse. That's Can't it. Go, can't go wrong. Since you're in Zechariah chapter 13, just go to verse 1. I said you ought to read it. In that day, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. We sing a song. The fountain that was open, drawn from Emmanuel's vein, and sinners plunged <coughs> beneath that flood lose all their guilty stain. That's what Zechariah is talking about. That fountain opened for sin. And it shall come to pass, verse 2, in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall be no more remembered. And I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. I'm, I'm going to pause there. I just want to talk about that fountain that was open. And we've already shown from Zechariah chapter 13, he's talking about the blood of Jesus Christ. So this evening, if you're not a Christian, if you've never been plunged beneath that flood to lose all your guilty stains, then we're going to be singing an invitation song. We hope that you will respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've already said, Mark 16 and verse 16, He that believeth and baptized shall be saved. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, The like figure whereunto he can baptism doth also now save us. That fountain drawn from Emmanuel's vein. If you've never been plunged beneath that flood, we're going to sing this song and invite you to obey the gospel. As a child of God, if you wandered away, if we can help, please come as we stand and as we sing. <laughs> <laughs>